Thank you very much, Mwalimu um, Masika, uh, for that welcome. And um, without further ado, I will proceed to the presentation. Um, as it has been um, um, given, my presentation is on African women traders in Nairobi, their opportunities and challenges, 1963, to 1973. Um, just um, a very brief introduction. Uh, this is a research on the participation of women in trade in the um, immediate years after independence. And um, I'm going to give a very brief uh, background um, because um, I cannot just start with uh, that 1963, there are events preceding 1963. But before that, I'd just like to give a very brief definition of what I think about um, in terms of opportunity and what I think um, mm -hmm. is meant by challenges for the purpose of this presentation. And I want to say that, um, Opportunity is an important concept in trade, um, as in business in general. And I want to give just a brief definition by short it all, that opportunity uh, refers to either concrete realities or an enactment of a trader's unique vision. Uh, in a sense, I am saying that um, opportunity can be discovered or opportunity can be made. It is not always the position that opportunity is just there. It can be um, somebody's vision. Um, uh, then I am giving just a simple definition of challenge. I'm using the Cambridge uh, Dictionary and it is a situation of being faced with something that needs great mental and physical effort in order to be done successfully. And in actual sense, it tests the person's ability to achieve whatever goal they have in front of them. I could also say uh, that challenges in this context will also include what we may call barriers, or obstacles to trade. Um, my paper is uh, divided into uh, four parts, that introduction which I've given. Then we have uh, a second part, which is the background that I've just told you I'm going to start with. And then we come to the core where I will be discussing the possibilities. So I will go to the background. Um, and we realize that um, the women traders have been there since pre-colonial times. That they um, came to trade in Nairobi was not anything new. They had been trading in the Nairobi area before the, um, the town began. Uh, we have examples, I will give just one. We have um, records that show that Kikuyu women brought maize, they brought beans and potatoes to the market. And they exchanged this with the Maasai who also brought goats, brought cows. And that exchange went on more or less throughout um, the pre-colonial period. And then we have the, uh, the coming of Nairobi. So the railway arrives. Um, and that marks the beginning of the town. And shortly after that, Nairobi becomes the capital of the British East Africa Protectorate, which made it a very important town, an administrative center, um, a commercial center, and the growing uh, population made it a, a population kind of, you know, center population came to congregate in the town. And as 
Nairobi grew. African traders, including the women, continued their business. And we find that as early as 1902, we have women selling vegetables uh, in the area of the Indian Bazaar. And the women continued doing this throughout uh, the period. Um, many of these women participated in this trade because they were not catered for in the new system of labor. They were not um, sought after for employment because the colonial wage labor system only needed the males. Yet that same system had introduced a money economy and women too needed to be part of the money economy. How were they to get there? <laughs> Some of them chose to be traders. We know from uh, the work of um, the work of Louise White that some of them were prostitutes. But let us keep it at some, uh, because not all women in Nairobi were prostitutes. So many women who desired to get cash to purchase various items, including some newly introduced Western goods used trade in order to get the money. So they used to trade to get integrated into the money economy. But we also um, know that these women were not welcome to the city. And so for more or less the whole period of um, the colonial um, period, I think from about the, the, 19, um, the early 1900s up to about 1940s, these women were actually a troubled group. The colonizers were in league with the African males to try and control the presence of these women for reasons were, that were best known to the African patriarchs. And I may say at this point that that reason was that they thought the women were running out of their control. It was their wish to retain control over women. And so every woman who came to trade in Nairobi was branded a prostitute. And so they would be, um, uh, they would be um, required to get back to their rural areas for the same control, patriarchy, that control of the men over women. And uh, in as much as that was the case, there are women who decided they would dread, some of them commuting to the town, others uh, living in Nairobi. And they would sell their goods, the commuters would sell their goods and go back. The residents would sell their goods, some of them inside their houses, others on the veranda, and others were hawkers. And they didn't mind being called prostitutes because at the end of the day, they wanted what they wanted, the money. They knew they were not. So they wanted the money and they looked for the money. Um, and then we come to um, the 1950s. The Mau Mau emergency begins in 1952 and the trading activities of women almost come to a standstill because the situation became unconducive to trade. And so for that period, a few daring women did manage to trade. And from my findings, they used their Mau Mau links to get protection and would trade at night. Uh, but for the majority, they left, went home. Others um, 
even those who are not uh, uh, in the Mau Mau would not stand the situation, they left. And we only get them coming back to the town from 1957 after the government, the colonial government begins to gradually um, um, uh, bring, uh, to gradually um, uh, lift the Mau Mau uh, regulations. By 1958, we have several women trading in Nairobi, hawking various goods, mainly agricultural items. The interesting thing is that for these women to get um, those trading premises, somehow a man had to come to their aid. And the lady told me that there was an important African um, in the city council called Didan Gitegi, who actually helped them to get licenses. Otherwise, she said, to get a stall, to get a license, one had, you know, to do so through the husband, and then you, you, you're trading in the premises, but the stall is in your husband's name, but that would not be possible if your husband was employed. So women were really in a kind of um, dilemma. If your husband has a job, you don't get the license. If he does not have a job, you get the license in his name, you trade there. But of course, much of the money probably will be his. Anyway, so this woman gets the stall in the early 1950s. She continues trading in this, this stall throughout the period, of course, not during Mau Mau. That is a story I have told elsewhere because during Mau Mau, she was actually beaten. One time she was leaving her stall and that made her take off to Embu. So she came back. Um, so at the end of, um, at the end of the Mau Mau period, some foreigners began to leave, some Asians, some Europeans, and the stalls were becoming empty. And so Africans were getting interested in these stalls, but the period between 1960 and 1963 was experienced a depression, the flight of capital as these people left the country. So again, going into uh, trade became a bit difficult. Um, so um, from 1963, things began to improve and the woman is now very established in her business, but there is a problem. Immediately after independence, um, the city council decides to allow the people selling, uh, the, the, the butchery owners in city market to also sell eggs. Initially, the egg and poultry sellers only dealt with egg and poultry and the butcher owners, the butchery owners only dealt uh, in meat. But now the butchery owners are also selling eggs. So there is competition. The same time, Nairobi is open. Africans are free to come to the city. We have several hawkers and many of them also opted to hawk eggs and they are moving from office to office. So this lady has to think of what to do. 
how is she going to survive amidst the competition? Others in the same business are also feeling the pinch. And so some of them begin to close down. And this rings a bell to the city council after some sellers of eggs and poultry lobby the city council to allow them to change the goods they sell. And many are allowed to sell um, to sell kiondos. But Joby says, no, I'm not going to sell kiondo. I have reasons that will make me stick to the egg and poultry business. But I have to know how to survive. Um, so what are her reasons and how is she to survive? Ndubi says that time, immediately after independence, her husband takes another wife and she's abandoned. She has her children to take care of. And her business is the one feeding the family and taking the children to school. If she starts on something new, she was definitely going to make a mistake because it was a risk. And because her husband is busy with another family, she was not going to ask him for help because anyway, he had proven that he was not ready to help this um, first family. So she has to stick to what she knows, to keep to what she has done for so many years, but she has to find a new way of doing it. She's also seeing her experience and she's saying, I'll not throw my experience down the drain. I'll stick and use that experience. And so she decides, I have to talk to people. I have to know how to survive. And she talks to an Asian friend who was also selling in the city market, selling the same goods. And the lady tells her, I survived by supplying eggs and poultry to various restaurants and hotels. Ndubi had gone to school way back in the 1940s before she got married. But immediately uh, she got married, uh, she left a teaching job that she was doing just before the, ma the marriage. Um, uh, event. So now Ndubi decides I can still speak English and I will use my English to try and save my business. So she, she now used two methods. There were customers that came to the market, but found the people who had, uh, the people whose stores they had fre frequented gone. So now who is going to sell to them? They want to find new, um, uh, new people to get used to. They will be taking eggs from them. So she entreats them to her stall using her English language. And she says, there were many um, people who were working in the Royal College. The Royal College was this institution. University of Nairobi then was the Royal College. So she says, there were many people who were working in the Royal College and they came to my stall 
and I talked nicely to them and they brought others. And then using the method from the Indian, she again used her English, walked around town to restaurants and hotels and through that she got hotels. She also got restaurants to supply eggs too. And she told me one of those restaurants was uh, on Moi Avenue, what we call Moi Avenue today, it was called Sanchiki. And then from Sanchiki, she was introduced to another uh, hotel called Blue Cat. And thereafter, she got other places. So that sustained her, but there was a problem still. Whenever she supplied her goods, her chicken and eggs, she was not paid on the spot. And therefore, she had to look for cash to continue supplying. And that made her borrow and borrow from friends. And she said, it is a problem she never really solved because she did not want uh, credit from any institution. It's not here a case of women lacking credit, but women being averse to credit. So she didn't want, even if it was available, she didn't want it. Um, so that is her position. Nonetheless, by 1969, this lady has actually made some good profit that she was able to put down uh, a deposit for a house in Uhuru Estate. Uhuru Estate houses were being constructed, I mean, were completed around 1969. She put down a deposit. By then, one of her children was already working and helped her to pay. So uh, that um, tells us of a woman who used uh, entrepreneurial uh, language in order to remain afloat in difficult circumstances. And we are seeing a woman who was not just able to seize available opportunities in the threat of competition, but actually reinvented herself to remain buoyant. Um, then we have another woman trader. Uh, this one was a Luo and she was called a Weef. Um, this also had traded since the colonial period. Um, the Africanization of the economy after independence which saw more Africans absorbed in formal employment worked in her favor. And why do I say so? Many of the employed became her customers and the eating joint blossomed. The short-lived unity in the government of President Kenyatta and his vice um, president, Jaramogi Okingodinga, but that worked to her advantage up to 1966. And so up to 1966, things were going on very well for Owith. What I haven't said is that Owith also closed her eatery sometime in 1953 and reopened it in 1959. Um, so during that period up to 1966, many customers traveled even from the city center or other parts of the town to Shaurimoyo to eat um, the mouth watering dishes prepared by this lady. This situation changed following the political events of the second part of the 1960s. In 1966, 
owing to a serious rift between President Jomo Kenyatta and his vice president, the vice president formed the Kenya People's Union uh, Opposition Party. The rift drew in it ethnic loyalties so that there was a clear rift between the Luo and the Kikuyu. And so Owid's Kikuyu clients and many other uh, clients from Kikuyu related groups began to dump her. And then in 1969, the assassination of Tom Boyer, a key Luo politician, takes place. And this was followed by skirmishes between the Luo and the Kikuyu in Nairobi and dealt a further blow to the woman's enterprise as now her whole Kikuyu clientele disappeared. And so we are seeing that for women traders like this woman, politics, the politics of the day defined their trading fortunes. It could bring downturns, it could bring uh, flowering times. But then our question comes, how did this particular woman handle the situation? Her solution to the politics of the day was to retreat to her ethnic backyard, to take advantage of ethnic loyalties. A Luo with Luya relations, she sought to appeal to clientele from both groups. And the heavy population um, uh, in migration into uh, Nairobi from Nyanza and Western, again, worked to her advantage. Incidentally, many of these migrants were bachelors, quote unquote, because many of them were married but left their wives back home. And like in many African communities in Kenya, men from these communities were traditionally schooled not to cook, cooking being rendered a female duty. And so these men who were bachelors did not like cooking. And therefore, they came to form the bulk of Owid's customers. At some point, they would actually just make it, make the place their, um, the, make the place their routine eating house. But at the end of the month, many more um, enjoyed the food at the eatery. Um, according to uh, this woman, the other thing that made her place attractive was her woman mother figure, because she says there were other places, other eateries that were run by men, but they were not as uh, popular as her joint. So the men preferred to go eating kwa mama. You know, we are going to eat at mama's place because we expect mama to give us good food. Uh, and so in time, given the politics of the day, this joint assumed the role of an ethnic meeting point in a town that now mimicked the ethnic political divisions in the country. And the woman made savings, which by 1972, she could use to expand her restaurant uh, business to Kariako Market. Her move to Kariako was informed by her perception of the area as a place of better returns. And indeed, 
um, a reading of uh, Stichter Sharon, uh, 1982, tells us that by 1968, Shaurimoyo was composed mainly of low income workers and 10% of the population was unemployed while Kariako was a white collar estate with only 3% unemployed. That made Kariako a more prime area for business. But there was another advantage to Kariako. Um, the Kariako market was the oldest African market, is the oldest African market in Nairobi. And for this reason, it had a, a somewhat time honored connection with African customers. And this bond was uh, reinforced by the market's closeness to the city center, a situation which made it more accessible to city center workers than career core. And the business in Kariako by this woman or with actually proved popular, more popular than even her joint in Shaurimoyo. That by the mid 1970s, uh, that's not part of our period, but just uh, for information, by the, the mid 1970s, the place was so popular that it became known as the Kariako Hilton. The Kariako Hilton implied pocket-friendly prices of high-quality food. And that reminds us of the Hilton Hotel, a high-class hotel. Now, Kariako mimicked the high-class hotel that we knew as the Hilton. Um, Owiz also recognized the importance of employees in an enterprise like hers where she could not work alone. But she also took note of the dichotomy of their contribution as they would either build a business or bring it down depending on how they handle customers. Her great desire was to manage them well, to be loyal, hardworking, and honest. Those are her words. Um, but being a woman, there are certain benefits that came with independence that women like with did not enjoy. During that period, the records tell us that the government organized some training for traders to enable them have better entrepreneurial skills. A reading of those records reveals to me that no women were included in those trainings and the women themselves say they have no idea that anything like that happened. The men I talked to said no women would attend such because women were not even expected to be trading in the first place. And so without uh, skills, without the, train, the kind of training that men enjoyed, Owen's approach to getting quality employees was to treat them as a mother. She was to treat them as her children. That is what she said. At the same time, she expressed concern that employees could be lax and that that would have ripple effects on customer retention. I just thought about it and I'm seeing a situation where this denial of entrepreneurial skills to women 
became a problem to them in um, handling employees. Being a mother figure may have encouraged the laxity because you are my mother anyway. Um, Uh, so um, we have a situation here of a woman who has experienced problems uh, uh, that, that include um, the political tensions, that include employees and, and others, but has again still struggled to remain afloat. So, uh, the whole picture that comes to my mind is what um, Claire, Robin, Claire Robinson uses in one of her chapters when talking about women traders. We only came here to struggle. And that moves me to the next um, case, which is the last one. Um, and I'm saying that apart from these ones who acquired premises during um, the colonial period, we have more joining in the period after independence, but I will give only one case study. Uh, one of these women was a woman named Wamboy. Wamboy was born in Chicago, in Muranga, and one boy never went to school. Uh, in 1948, at the youthful, the youthful age of 16, she got married in Kembu, not far from the present uh, day Kenyatta University. Initially, um, they survived her and her husband by cultivating the small family farm, as well as other people's farms for cash to earn a living. In 1960, one boy's husband got a job with East African Railways. And so they moved to Nairobi and lived in the railway quarters at Landimawe. However, by that time, the couple already had some children and life was hard. The man's salary of about 100 shillings barely met the basic needs of the family. In fact, despite the economic boom of the years, the ever rising cost of living and lifestyle changes reduced wages. Moreover, the need to educate children, which by the 1960s was not only fashionable, but was viewed by many parents as a form of investment for security in old age made further demands on family budgets. And so amidst the rising popularity of education, scores of parents, including one boy and her husband, wanted their children to go to school. But owing to the adverse economic circumstances of the family, they could not afford this for a while. A determined one boy dreamt of being a trader to supplement her husband's earnings, especially to have their children go to school. But one boy is also aware that Raising startup capital would be difficult because what her husband gets is so little they cannot save much from it. So her aim was to save just a little, just something small to start the business. And she talked of one or two shillings. And her aim was to start selling cigarettes. Why? Because she realized that many residents in Landimawe 
and the neighboring Mutsurwa railway housing estates were smokers. So she's seeing a possibility here. And she's thinking, if only I could have a shilling, I'd start. Uh, but like many men of the years, Wamboi's husband disapproved of his wife's desire to trade because according to him, it would introduce her to prostitution. So the man is saying, no, who as we are, we will survive, but you're not going to trade. Uh, of course, this idea had its roots in the colonial period. As I said, every woman in Nairobi was seen to be a prostitute. Uh, nevertheless, owing to the persistence of the unfavorable family economic situation and the woman's persistent pleas to the husband, and even going further to give him assurances of loyalty, her humility eventually won the day. And her husband not only allowed her to look for money and start trading, but he personally raised for her two shillings as initial capital to embark on the sale of cigarettes on the veranda, not anywhere else, on the veranda of their house. And so the woman uh, launched her uh, unlicensed uh, veranda sale of cigarettes. And this was convenient, conveniently located at a point where she could do her trading and combine that with um, house chores, including the care of children. But having no education became Wamboi's first challenge. How was she to effectively engage in the exchange of goods without the requisite literacy and numeracy skills? But this is a very interesting lady. She observed other illiterate women counting, using their fingers, and began using the method. But this enabled her to count only up to 10 because of our 10 fingers. Beyond this, she had problems doing the math. Remaining observant, she again adopted the use of a bundle of sticks as she observed other women using the method. This is a woman who has not stepped into any classroom. Um, and so she is struggling. About a year into the sale of cigarettes, she realized that the commodity profit was too minimal to improve the state of want in her family. She yearned for something better, something that would give better returns. But she says, yet there were no places women could obtain credit because we were, women were not even supposed to do business. She's like saying, my husband was kind to allow me to go out there. The other two ladies have talked about one, the, the, the weed is a widow, so there is no man controlling her, at least. The other one, the husband has abandoned, but now this one is living with her. It's a family, they are all living together. And I found interviews um, with Mary Okello on YouTube. Mary Okello, the first woman bank manager in Kenya and founder, uh, sorry, and founder member of the Kenya Women Finance Trust, uh, actually reports that owing to the very in, uh, discriminatory rules and regulations throughout the 1960s, women had no contractual rights. In brief, they could not take credit from anybody. 
they had no contractual rights. Although they could have a bank account, they had no borrowing rights to enable them access certain bank products like loans without the guarantee of a mail. According to Okello, even taken generally, women bank clients were very few. And as I proceed, you will actually realize that even one boy kept her money in a box in the house. She had a savings place in the house. And so we are saying that this meant that unlike the men who had access to bank facilities, the women traders had to struggle to raise their own capital, whether for venture startup or venture development. And so by, 19, um, by 1962, after a whole year of struggle to save, the woman had 20 shillings in her home savings. She calls it home savings. Having realized that the railway quarters of Landi Mawe, where she lived, and the neighboring ones of Makongeni and Mudurwa estates were teeming with children who loved pastries, like Mandazi, she launched the business of preparing and hawking the pastries. So this lady is still looking for opportunities and she's creating them. Uh, still looking for more possibilities, she later observed that charcoal was the most used cooking fuel in her estate and embarked on its sale. While during the day, she juggled in managing both the hawking of, of mandazi and the selling of uh, cigarettes and, and charcoal, her children relieved her in the evenings and holidays, as well as weekends, and her husband also helped. And interestingly, the husband gave the money to the woman. By the time Kenyatta became prime minister in 1962, the woman's intricate strategy was beginning to pay dividends. She says, and I quote, I had a lot of money, 109 shillings kept in a wooden box in the house. That same year saw the completion of Landis Road Retail Market. Consequently, retailers until then accommodated in a section of the Mincing Lane Market were to be re relocated to the new market. So the Mincing Lane Market, which today we call Markiti or the wholesale market, initially had both the retail and the wholesale. Now, after the construction of the retail market nearby, the retail section is to move. Um, one boy wanted space at the new retail market, but was disqualified on grounds that she had not been a retailer in the Mincing Lane market but she did not stop trying. She talked to her husband, who being a relative of Munyo Wayaki, who was then the district chairman of the Kano branch, helped them, used his influence to get this lady as tall at the retail market. So Munyo Wayaki is a relative of one boy's husband. So one boy uses the relationship between her husband and Munyo Wayaki, and Munyo Wayaki delivers. One boy gets a stall at the retail market. And so again, we see here uh, 
we see here the manipulation of ethnicity like we saw earlier in the case of Owiz. The manipulation of ethnicity and kinship in order to achieve a goal. Nonetheless, this actually became a milestone in Wamboi's trading career because it now launched her into established enterprise. The woman's returns at the market were better than what she had obtained from the sale of cigarettes, charcoal, and mandazi combined, and provided better food and clothing for the family. Even so, the proximity of the retail market to the Mincing Lane uh, market slowed down the business at the market because most customers still preferred to buy produce more cheaply at the wholesale market. And so even though she's getting better returns, she feels she can do better and continue saving through thrift. By the early 1970s, this lady expanded her operations by opening and a small restaurant at the OTC bus stage, where she now began selling cooked food. Um, her business at the retail market ran concurrently with this one for a while, but because she was not managing it, the profits declined and she closed it. She now concentrated on the cooked food business at the OTC. Here, the bus departures and arrivals uh, the bus departures and arrivals made the place a beehive of activity and provided one boy with the ideal market she had been looking for. And again, using her words, she says, I made money, ate good food, dressed my family well. Um, even so, the money failed to achieve her main goal of educating the children because the children didn't love school, didn't like school, and all the three boys dropped out. She says, well, I could not force them to learn. Nonetheless, they became an asset to her exchange activities where their assistance became indispensable as time went by. Um, the woman's other asset was a very understanding husband whom she constantly consulted. Um, and she, at this point, remembered back home in Kiambu, they had very little land. And so having saved money from their business, she and her husband thought the best thing they could do was to purchase land. And they settled for a new home in Loitokitok, uh, a sub-county of the larger Kajiado County. I want to say that Wamboi was a multitask trader. I dare say also that she was a go-getter. Starting as a hawker, she manipulated her way into established business, taking advantage of kinship in politics. Her ability to identify and seize opportunities increased her earnings a fact which went a long way in giving her a voice in the family. In brief, one boy's 
trading activities empowered her. Uh, I just want to conclude by saying that um, the situation, the economic situation of Kenya after independence created business opportunities, which um, a number of these women seized and struggled with. They may have had, uh, there are many other obstacles, but at the end of the day, the three that I've talked about managed to remain afloat. Thank you very much for listening to me. Wow. Thank you very much, my teacher. Thank you uh, for taking us through that a lot to learn. Um, I don't know what to, where to start, but very interesting. The journey that women have gone through to where they are this day, well detailed in their presentation. Uh, Malimu began by demonstrating that Kenyan independence opened up new horizons for women, uh, for African women traders. And as demonstrated in uh, examples that she gave, you will agree, all of us will agree that uh, indeed women uh, have come, come a long way. Uh, she mentioned the women interaction with the today's Nairobi, with today's Nairobi began way before uh, colonial period where tri uh, butter trade was taking place between the Maasai and the Agikuyu. Uh, I don't know whether the Kamba were also involved. Uh, maybe she will mention that uh, around Nairobi and that uh, coming of Nairobi opened new avenue for uh, women and that women achieved or we, women achieved because of the challenges they faced that the colonial or the post-colonial uh, early economy was not favorable to women and therefore they devised their own survival methods that made them uh, to be uh, to achieve what they did. And that's why she mentioned that women uh, women traders emerged from the trouble, they were a troubled group in an economy that uh, did not really uh, care for them. Uh, she also mentioned that during Mau Mau era, women also utilized their link with Mau Mau to progress. And that leads me to maybe uh, my teacher will uh, respond to this. How did these women evade the colonial brutal securities eye at the time? Uh, at the time. Uh, then uh, she walked us through from 1963 at independence uh, that women stories are emerging again. They are achieving, they are working hard. Uh, and now they start moving into Nairobi because the place is open. There are no restrictions that we had during the colonial period. And that also leads me to a simple question. How did the opening of Nairobi and subsequent movement of women from the rural areas to Nairobi affect the family unit in the rural areas? How did it affect the family unit uh, in the rural areas? Then she walked us through case studies of three women uh, whose success stories uh, she has taken us through, uh, Owitz uh, and Wambui, they're very encouraging and how they maneuvered uh, through the barriers to rise to where they, uh, they were. But then a quick one before I take questions from the audience is uh, you mentioned that women were not given uh, licenses to trade at the beginning. And, but we see the women going to 
eat at the new hotel, now the hotel in Eastlands, the, the Hilton, the African Hilton in, in Eastlands. And some of these men who are going to eat there were civil servants. Didn't they see the need to encourage these women or did they, didn't they see the need that when they are organizing training, they incorporate these women uh, traders? Now, uh, with all that, uh, may I open the session uh, to the audience so that I take a few questions? I'll start Dr. Margaret Gashi, first question. Then you, we have the second question. You remind me if you. Let's start with Dr. Gashi. Then the third question, uh, Dr. Kenneth Ombongi. Uh, let's take those three and then uh, we allow Malimu to respond. Karibu, Dr. Tari. Uh, thank you very much. Understand. Pamela, thank you very much for that very wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, I suppose. Um, the discussion falls uh, within what we call um, feminine epistemology studies that show us how gender influences our understanding of knowledge, justification, and theory of knowledge. So thank you very much. I think that was fresh. Now, um, my first question pertains to methodology, Pamela, uh, in your work. Maybe you'd like to Tell us the methodology you have used to put your paper uh, together. And the reason I ask this is that you're talking about trade, women and trade. And trade here, I suppose, would go against uh, the grain of a patriarchal dispensation. And therefore, I ask to what extent, if any, has the methodology you have used benefited or used the feminist research approach, uh, if only to tease out the invisible knowledge gaps that exist because of the way women's perspectives have been left out in our traditional methods of data collection and analysis. Uh, my question, my second uh, small question, uh, pertains to uh, the question of female-headed households. And uh, the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, the World Bank, uh, tells us that three, actually four out of 10 households in Kenya are headed by women. And I think that translates to something like 36%. Of course, there are other variables, but um, in your study, in your very good paper, is there any intersection between women seeking economic empowerment, in our case trade, and female-headed households in the area of your study? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Terry. Good afternoon. My name is Wilson. Thank you, Dr. Ari, for that elaborate discussion. I have a few questions I'd like to uh, put across. Number one, apart from the hotel business, is there another leisure activities which these women were involved? Because I understand that they were in a prime area where we have other social events. What role did leisure play in their business? Number two, um, on Owit's side, there's a time, there's a point we have said that she closed her uh, Italy. Why did she do that? If you can be able to elaborate that. Um, the last, the second last, can we say that particular tendencies of the customers played a key role in making business prosper during the first period? of tension between the radical and moderate post-colonial Kenya? Is it because of the socialization of these women, the first two, or it was by a coincidence that they were able to use their motherly uh, 
tendencies to uh, attract those uh, men who are uh, who are what bachelors per se. The last one is we can see that both men and women faced a uh, difficult time. Can we say that women faced more challenges than men? Because we can understand that the post-colonial Kenya, both men and women faced challenges. Can we say that bo um, women faced more challenges than, than men? Thank you, Dr. Asante. Thank you. Thank you, Wilson. Uh, um, uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Malim. Uh, you know, one thing I share with uh, Masika and maybe Wilson is that Malim uh, Mungasa uh, was our teacher when we were small boys in undergraduate, so, and, and she taught us very well. So we hold her with a lot of esteem. Um, thank you very much for, you know, a, a very interesting study. Uh, which, um, in my view, demonstrates uh, the contradictions of post-colonial modernity uh, as it is manifested in, uh, uh, you know, gendered inequalities, uh, uh, marginalization, and, and also an element of uh, 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 class contradictions, if, if, if I understood you uh, uh, well. And and it's a big lesson for 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 many of us, uh, uh, you know, from the way you you presented it with some level of clarity. Now, just a few questions following from what colleagues have have, have, have asked. Um, the, the the first one is very closely related to what Masika uh, raised about um, uh, a, a very paternalistic. Uh, uh, immediate post-colonial situation in Nairobi. Uh, Nairobi, in the first decade of independence, which we are covering, uh, was actually a men-only affair, uh, basically. And uh, that led to the uh, uh, notions of the Bajala boy. If, if, if you read um, uh, Atiyan Atiyambo's uh, article on contours of leisure, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Nairobi. And um, in, in the study that um, I'm doing, which I labeled Women on Top, uh, uh, which I'm doing with a, a friend of mine, Mr. Sang, we you know, discovered that uh, one of the very ingenious ways women used to navigate uh, the the the, the pater paternalistic controls of uh, the the colonial uh, setting and the immediate post-colonial setting setting is just is that uh, they presented themselves as spoiled uh, 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 you know women uh, according to of course uh, the dictates of uh, the overly patriarchal society in which uh, in which we live. Uh, the, the women we call uh, uh, who went to the Jumba, then were named Chip Jumba in, in Kalenjin, uh, they, they, they just uh, lived what patriarchy could define as spoiled lives. Uh, you know, they dressed, quote unquote, badly. Uh, they kept bad company. Uh, they drank beer. Uh, occasionally, they could beat up men. Um, uh, you know, as um, some way of and way of going around the controls, and finally, uh, you know, they became among uh, the very empowered uh, women uh, among the the Kalenjin community. The women who moved to town, if things did not work in the countryside, they moved to town to make a living. I, I was just wondering, um, how did these women traders? Uh, manage theirs because uh, you, you 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 kind of platantly said yes they were not uh, uh, prostitutes uh, that uh, Louisa White talks about in her book Comforts of Home um, so if they could if they were not bad women in quotes uh, then what were they that enabled them survive in uh, in 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 that environment. 
My, you know, second question is, um, I don't know whether you will want to talk a bit about the interface uh, between this patriarchal system and uh, urbanization and how that played, uh, uh, played out in uh, determining uh, the patterns, the trends of uh, women entrepreneurship. Uh, uh, you know, I, I didn't hear uh, a lot about that, but uh, if you can help us understand uh, uh, how the, the, the three uh, uh, inter, inter, intersected, uh, you know, patriarchy on one side, uh, you know, urbanization, uh, and then um, a, a group of women that seems to me that uh, given the conditions in which they existed, uh, they were really entrepreneur, if, 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 if you looked at them. And, and finally, um, Dr. Gache touched on this methodology. I, I like um, your idea of going ethnographic. Uh, you know, the case histories. Uh, at some point, if somebody did not know that you are a historian, uh, then he could have thought you are an anthropolo a socio anthropologist. Uh, uh, now, uh, the, 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 the personal narratives on which you base uh, some of the conclusions, I was just wondering how they can help us unbundle the, the, the shifts in the practices of these women uh, in terms of customer base, uh, you know, profits or lack of them, uh, changes in the commodities they sold, uh, because uh, th these shifts basically over time uh, makes your work become historical, uh, because otherwise if it remains uh, at the level of uh, uh, fairly personalized histories and narratives, then we will fail to see those shifts that, uh, uh, you know, are the essence of uh, historical scholarship. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mwalimu Karibu. Um, thank you very much um, for those questions. I will try. Um, the first question asks us, um, how did these women evade the brutal eye of colonialism? Uh, that is when I talked about some few women managing to trade during uh, the Mau Mau. Uh, it was a very difficult time for all, whether one was for Mau Mau or against. And this was again for both men and women. Uh, you remember I just mentioned the case of Ndubi, who was actually beaten uh, sometime when she was going to her shop. Uh, she was, uh, she met uh, Mau Mau guys and they tried to uh, talk to her using some language which she refused to respond to the way they wanted her to respond and they beat her. And after that, she just went, packed her things and followed her husband in Embu. Her husband was already uh, back in Embu after he was also threatened. Um, it is interesting what this woman told me that they would actually use some, I, I don't know how to put this properly in English, but they used uh, some panya roots, you know, uh, uh, not, not the road, not the known roots to carry goods like from some areas in Kiambu at night under the protection of some Mau Mau, and then they would sell them in some areas like in Pumwani and other African regions. And the, 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 the selling had to be done very quickly. 
And there was always a Mau Mau person standing and watching to see if the home guards were around. And if any was seen, they'd quickly disappear into the night. But this was very rare and it was a big risk that they took. Um, that is how far I can go. Uh, then uh, I also have this question of, how did the opening of Nairobi and the movement um, to the town affect family life? I may be simplistic here, but from the mere fact that the majority of uh, the majority of the population in Nairobi during the first 10 years of independence remained male, means that families were separated. I have a personal experience. My father worked in Nairobi from around 1968, but all of us were at home with our mother. So uh, that was the normal, that the women remain at home to take care of the land, to cultivate, but the man would be here to work and uh, send some money for uh, family maintenance at home. But also we must remember that there was a gradual improvement of family life in Nairobi, which started way back in the 1940s, when uh, the colonial system realized that just having the males alone in Nairobi was not beneficial. Their contracts were very short, and um, that made having experienced African workers very difficult. So from the 1940s, we find the colonial government uh, the colonial uh, Nairobi, um, uh, the colonial Nairobi uh, government, beginning to uh, build houses for families in order to stabilize labor. After independence, this stabilization of labor um, began in earnest. Now, so that by the 1970s my work will be talking a lot about families being in Nairobi. So for that period, what was happening in the colonial period kind of continued. But remember people, in the 1960s, the, the Mau Mau war of the 1950s had also sent away so many people from Nairobi who remained out of Nairobi for quite some time. So we have many factors at play in this regard, but we must not forget that there was a gradual process leading to the stabilization of labor and therefore having families in Nairobi. Um, I talked about licenses that were not given to women. That was during the colonial period. During the, uh, in the period after independence, yes, this continued, but a woman like Owith, who already had a license, simply expanded. In fact, she, it is on record and her name is there. Her business in Shaurimoyo was in house CCN6. And so she operated the business there for a while. And when she opened the Kariako, which became the Kariako Hilton, she somehow used just the same license. So there was nothing like looking for a new license, but many women at the time still got um, the, the husband, looked for the business premises, 
re, uh, registered it under his name, but the wife operated the business. And that is again, because of the problem of women not having contractual rights. Uh, there is a lot of law here and I'm not a lawyer. So again, I find it a bit difficult to explain. Um, then we have um, the methodology, which has come from uh, Maggie and, um, and the chair. Uh, my methodology for this study, uh, if I put it simply, was the usual. Um, you read through the library and then the archives and then the, um, the interviews. And then um, I chose to use case studies or case histories because I find them explaining better what I want to pass across. Um, in as far as that helps me get the historical shifts is that I look at the woman's trade, how she has moved from um, one period to another, how that has meant development or not, because I also have cases of women who actually because of competition, they left the business, they just closed because they could not um, manage to compete or they could not manage to you know, do things in a different way. Um, and so if looked at generally, I consider the 1960s as the real beginning of established business, much as we have the two women that in my study, I call them pioneers in established business. I did not find any other apart from Oweez and Duby. Those are the only ones who are in established business from the early 1950s. Um, then I said Oweez closed. Ndubi closed. Why? Because of the Mau Mau. The situation was so difficult for them that Oweez actually went back home in Nyanza in her location in Alego and stayed there up to 1959. Then she came back. Ndubi went to Meru, stayed there, up to about 1957, 58, came back and reopened. And that was after they got assurances that the place was now safe for them to continue. But remember, for somebody like Luby, she still had to get the letter that would enable her enter back into the city. Um, so the methodology here and the shifts come through the very um, um, the very explanations, because as I interviewed the women, I also asked them for the times. And we are talking about corroborating these times with the known events. Like when somebody says, I got uh, established premises, then I ask them, now this was a time when like, what do you remember was happening? That's why I'm able to say that when the prime minister became prime minister, when Jomo Kenyatta became prime minister, because this is part of what I have gotten from the, 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 the women. Um, some will relate these events with other events like Talk about talking about 1952, they'll talk about Mau Mau just began. Or somebody will tell you the queen was here and that helps me relate. Um, when we come to like 1973, many of them remember when we started having many matatus on the roads and that is the time 
Kenyatta actually lets the Matatu business really begin in, in earnest. Uh, so I'm using, uh, I'm, I'm relating the issues to the known events in order to get the shifts. Um, um, Female-headed households. Um, uh, this is very interesting, Maggie, and uh, there is a lot to say here, but more about the hawkers than the established traders, because uh, many of these hawkers, uh, many of the hawkers I interviewed are, you know, of female-headed households. But the established traders, interestingly, um, most of them have been in a marriage and most of them um, have a relationship with, there is a relationship between them acquiring the premises, them acquiring the goods, them acquiring the funds. It's a lot of relationship between them and the male. Uh, so when I talk about the hawkers, I will talk a lot about the female-headed households. I don't know why that happened. I'm not sure why. Uh, probably I need to read more. But for my established traders, there is so much of them and the men in their lives. Um, apart from hotel business, what other activities did women do? Um, eating houses, if I may call them, were just one of the areas of the women's trade. Uh, especially when we come to established business, women did, um, uh, women did um, eating house, women did the sale of um, grains, women did the sale of um, baskets, kiondos like uh, the women of Kariako. There are many other things that um, women sold and like the kiondos are a traditional, um, good for women from many communities. So women still sold many of those. And women sold a lot of vegetables, fruits, and other raw foods apart from the cooked. Um, Uh, there was also the question of socialization, which I didn't really get properly. Uh, I kind of uh, got it like, was socialization the main reason why uh, the bachelors were attracted, um, for example, to a with? The socialization bit here has to do with men cooking. Uh, they are being attracted to a weave. And unless we, we stretch it further, I say it probably. I, you know, sometimes we need more evidence in order to confirm an issue. I said probably seeing a weave as a mother figure, as a woman, and they expect women to cook, and then they. Um, and, and, and of course, they eat the food cooked by a woman that probably made them attracted to a weave. And remember the bachelors, many of them, even those that were married and had left their wives at home, were young people. Most of them were young people, very young people. By the time of the 1960s, or we've has been in Nairobi since 1938. So Oweave is actually a real mother figure. Attracting these people, they whenever they want to go to eat at her place, 
people are seeing like, we are going to mama's place. And when mama goes there, I mean, sorry, when they go there, mama gives them good food. So mama's place ends up becoming a meeting point, a rendezvous. Um, the other one is about women facing more challenges than men, definitely. From the narrative that I have given, women have to struggle to raise capital. They are not in employment. They cannot get a loan. Even as they trade, they have house chores waiting for them. I mean, women are really challenged in many areas. And even to trade, they have to seek a man's uh, permission. They have to humble themselves, assure the man that really, really, I'm not going to be a prostitute. I will remain loyal to you. That's a challenge. The man doesn't have to go to the, to, to the wife to say, even as I go to work, I'll remain loyal. Anyway. <laughs> um, then it is, then there is this uh, question of uh, how the whole study demonstrates the contradictions of modernity. Um, again, I feel challenged here. How does it demonstrate the contradictions of modernity? Yes, modernity, part of modernity is that women are struggling to get their space. Unlike them years when they were yes, yes people. And as they struggle to get their space, the men are struggling against women getting that space. So we have a problem here that the men are pulling to that direction while the men, the women are pulling to the other direction, giving us a contradiction. And the men like Wamboy, uh, sorry, and the women like Wamboy um, have struggled until they have a voice. Before uh, she was a trader, she has to plead until the man accepts her humility and says, I'll not just allow you to trade, but I'll give you these two shillings. My wife now go into the business, but it has to be here. Nowhere else, here on the veranda of the house. But as time goes by, and the woman is so aggressive. And remember, she's bringing money, and money makes us bend even when we are very straight. So as she brings the money, the man is realizing, yeah, something good is happening here. And yes. Um, so the man allows her to keep on looking and to keep on um, doing what she knows best how to do. Um, then we have the idea of um, the paternalistic issues, men only affairs. I, I think I have handled that somewhere, maybe. Yeah. Um, uh, then we have how did the women traders manage? Um, yeah. I, that too, I think, is also done. Yeah. Basically, I think I have answered uh, all the questions, but I'd like to come back, Maggie, to uh, your case about um, the, the, the theory I have used here is uh, social uh, feminism. Yeah, and I would go into the details of what it explains, but I think we can read. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Malimu. Uh, let me take a second round now from online. I can see uh, Dr. Missy Gurvand is up. Uh, 
Yeah. Let's go online, then we'll come back to the second round. So let me take the questions online. I can see Dr. Misigo on, kindly unmute Malimu, Dectari, and then ask your question. Uh, thank you very much, Masika. I don't know if you can hear Dr. me. Dr. Misigo, clear. if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you, Masika. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. 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 We can hear yes. you. We can hear you. Okay. Can I go on? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Masika and Mali Mungesa, uh, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, uh, perhaps what I share with Mali Mungesa is that um, you are employed on the same day together in the Kikui campus. And at one time, we were supervised by the same people, the late Professor Milika Achola and Professor Muriuki. Getha jokes with me that uh, I'm a student of Professor Achola, but I should not be like Professor Achola. On the second note, I want to apologize. I was supposed to be the discussant today. Uh, but because of other uh, issues, I was not be, uh, be able to be in Nairobi. But nonetheless, let me ask one or two questions um, to Madam Ngesa. The first question will be, uh, Madam Ngesa, where would you place, where would you situate your study? Is it under economic history, social history, or where will you situate your study? I think from my case will be economic history. And if that is the case then, if it's economic history, then we would like to hear uh, 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 more of statistics. For example, how many women are we talking about in Nairobi? How many women are we talking about in Nairobi? What are the indicative numbers. Number two, where did the women, um, where did the women get, you have mentioned it in passing, where did the women get the uh, startup capital? Is it only from the husbands and those who were single? Where did they get the startup capital? Um, uh, uh, number three, we know, for example, that African traders occupied the lowest level on the ladder of trade in colonial Kenya. So how come then women were able to navigate, to navigate the challenges perhaps more than men and start trading in Nairobi? Yet the colonial government was against African engaging in trade because they were to provide labor to the European farms. Um, I've asked, for example, how many women are we talking about? Uh, that I've asked. Then did the number of women traders increase in the post-colony period or it remained the same? If it increased, why? Or if it is it decreased, um, uh, uh, why? Um, and then, what is the, the volume of trade are we talking about? What is the share of the control of women in trade in Nairobi in terms of percentages? Yeah, what are the share? I mean, how do they share this trade? Maybe the indicative percentages that we want to hear. Uh, that maybe 30% was being controlled by women or 10% and so. And then what do these percentages tell us of, um, um, of, the, of, the, of the overall um, uh, uh, trade um, uh, as such? And then the other issue that I'll talk about is how does your study speak to the theory of challenge and response in that what are these challenges that women faced to start 
for example, the, the entrepreneurship. Do you see that the theory of challenge and response can then add to the theory um, uh, uh, that um, uh, you have used? And then again, we see, how does your study speak to the whole issue of the Nyumbandogo phenomenon in Nairobi? Dr. Mbongi will uh, know the Nyumbandogo thing, uh, the Luyas and Luos, whereby you leave your, your wife at home, you have mentioned it, Madam Pamela, and you go to Nairobi, but in Nairobi, you find another wife that you are staying with. And therefore, your wife from the village cannot come to Nairobi unless she has informed you sufficiently. Do we see these Nyumbandogo women engaged in trade in Nairobi, those who were living with the men from the rural areas, yet they were not, you can say, married to them. It was almost like um, 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 a simple, symbiotic relationship that you have a wife at home where you go once in a year, uh, in December, for the case of uh, Louis, but you have, for example, let me use tribes here. You have, for example, a Kikuyu lady in Nairobi that you stay with every day. And therefore, the Nyumbandogo phenomenon came up. So how does your study then speak to the Nyumbandogo phenomenon? And lastly, then, how come we do not see women enterprises saying, for example, this is a hotel, for example, Indian Towers, or a bank that were established by women, for example, from Muranga, in the case of, for example, in the case of the men, in the case of Leland Towers, in the case of other hotels, in the case of Family Bank, in the case of, um, of uh, Equity Bank, and so on and so forth. How come we don't see such like major movers in the economy as women? How come we don't see them in, uh, as like men? And then lastly, how come we don't see children fighting over their mother's wealth coming from trade, even if these ladies were single? Thank you very much. Um, I, um, I hope I, I was heard. Much, uh, Dr. can I move to Dr. Owaka? Dr. Owaka, kindly unmute and speak to us. Yes, uh, thank you, Pamela. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Uh, thank you, Pamela, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, can't hear along you. The, kindly unmute along yourself. the line, I've unmuted. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Can you hear me? We, we can hear you online. I don't know why they can't hear you. Yes, now that is tricky. But what? we can hear you. Yes, I was we, just. We can hear you. Okay, thank you, thank you. I was wondering, along the line you mentioned um, uh, sessional paper number 10 of 1965, uh, African Socialism and its uh, application to planning in Kenya. This paper is the bedrock upon which uh, development in Kenya has been based for a long, long, long time. Uh, I know that uh, uh, most policies, uh, every time development policies and position papers uh, make reference to this paper. But uh, we are also aware of its many, many shortcomings. Uh, Barack, Barack Obama Sr. and Daram Guy men said the paper is not a socialist. Many people have said that. David Deere, I remember, he made some comments. The paper is development fundamentalism. Mutafa Kangu, if I remember again, the paper is a policy malfunction. Okoto Gendo, and many, many other people. But I'm just interested. What is your view? It, many have thought that this paper was the bane of um, development in Kenya. It excluded... Uh, mainstream women, not just mainstream women, but it, it was gender insensitive. What is your point on that? Remember, I'm talking about uh, gender insensitive uh, from the perspective that it even decided 
that there are high uh, potential areas where money should be, resources should be poured. And those others like ours and yours and all that should, should trickle down, to get the trickle down, the crumbs. What is your position? What, what is your view on the session on paper and women and development in Kenya? Uh, especially, although you've already pointed out that uh, credit was a problem for women, but what, what, what is your reading of this session on paper vis-a-vis -vis, uh, your discussion today? Thank you so much. Uh, can we hear Angela, please? Angela Mbitho. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mwalimu Pamela. Um, very engaging, very interesting, very digestible. And I think for me, it just demonstrates uh, the beauty of the art of storytelling because we are online and we have been with you and we have understood through your anecdotes and your narrative, you know, just how, what the experiences were of the three women traders that you talked about. Um, and as an entrepreneur myself, I truly could relate. Uh, I understand also as, as someone who practices, practices research that, you know, I'm cognizant that your methodology is through case studies and I believe literature review. And therefore, it limits you perhaps from making generalizations to an entire population of women traders, I think, as Professor uh, Dr. Mesigo has just mentioned. Um, my question, though, is, is there a nexus in your, uh, as you were doing your study, was there a nexus between uh, the number, uh, the success of, and the types of trade that the women took uh, took part in. So was there some sort of relationship that you could see? And I will tell you in a short, in a minute, what I'm trying to, to, to bring out. Um, and secondly, is there an in intersectionality therefore between the ethnicity of the women traders and their success therein? Maybe it would point out to the access to resources, to the kingship ties, uh, the social networks. And the reason why I ask this, uh, Mwalimu Pamela, is I lived in Nairobi, I've lived in Nairobi all my life. And perhaps apart from the lady you mentioned, when we walked around as little young kids in school, the traders that we interacted with, and this is by no means a way of generalizing, it's just experience and an anecdote too, were predominantly from one ethnic community. Now, whether it was by default or design is something that perhaps would be interesting to see and therefore leads me to my next question, which is how has it manifested today? How do you loop it in or triangulate what you have you know, um, narrated to us about the women in the and the experiences in the 1960s and 70s, et cetera, and today, could you then perhaps create a linkage and say, for instance, that those women, depending on whether they were from a predominant ethnic community, for instance, were able to mentor, to lower down the ladder, and therefore have in one way or another influenced uh, the number of traders and entrepreneurs that we see today and the success therein from a specific, you know, homogeneous community. Thank you. Very interesting uh, presentation, by the way. Thank you. Uh, can I move to Abiero Opondo? Brief, please, Abiero, proceed. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Gesa, for this uh, good illuminating presentation. I am a Biero Mo University, receive greetings from Dr. Onduru. He says you are in school together. Now, this is the kind of topic that we like because this is social history where we're discussing the marginalized. In this case, the women are fighting for spaces in the urban centers. We at Moi are doing a similar, almost a similar research with the German-based um, African clusters center, looking at women cross-border traders across uh, Malaba and Busia. And I wanted to know
case of women traders. Uh, uh, secondly, what was the role of the tribal welfare groups like the Luo Union, uh, which was very prominent in Nairobi in terms of helping the, the ladies, you, you wanted to the know? lady traders? Kindly repeat. Again? Malimu, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can hear you. Proceed, proceed. Uh, we lost you a bit. You wanted to know. Yeah, I wanted to know the, the role of the tribal welfare groups like the Lua Union in helping the women traders. And then the push and pull factors and the market, the politics of the market and how women fitted in these contested spaces. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Can I Welcome. hear Welcome. from Stephen? Stephen, kindly unmute and speak to us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Malimu Pamela, for your presentation. Mine is a follow up to the question that was uh, raised uh, by Dr. Misigo Nyumbandogo. And uh, I'm just interested to find out how the economic empowerment of women uh, altered or transformed gender power dynamics in African family setup in Nairobi. So, so what was the outcome of this particular economic empowerment? Did it have some impact in terms of gender power dynamics in the African family setup or not? Thank you. Very much. Uh, now let's go to the comments online. Most of them, they have raised them uh, personally uh, from Stephen, uh, then uh, Malimo Biero. Can we go a little bit? Uh, Mikali says, thank you for your presentation. How can you interface gender dynamics and affirmative action? Uh, and Malimu, kindly respond to that uh, and kindly summarize. Time is not on our side. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, my online audience, uh, for those questions. Um, I'm starting with uh, Dr. Misigo's uh, issues, uh, where I would situate my, uh, my study, whether it is economic, social, or whatever it is. Uh, Daktari, I wish to uh, first take note of the fact that this is history. And um, therefore, even if we were to use statistics, we would not be able to come up with some of the kind of statistics you're asking for, because those ones should be for economists who study the current issues as uh, it were. Uh, and so, um, what I want to say is basically my study is uh, social history. And that I say because I am more concerned with how the women, why the women have, uh, why the women um, traded, where they traded, and above all, how that trade, the, the proceeds from the trade impacted the family. I'm not so much concerned with the statistics of the percentages of women in trade, the percentages of maybe them versus men. Those ones I leave to economists, the practicing economists. And uh, for that reason, I am limited in the extent to which I can use statistics because whatever statistics I'm able to use are those that I find in the records and their statistics that tell me about things like the situation in Kenya that 
I use as a basis to explain the possibilities that became available for women traders. Um, uh, that, that actually makes it, um, uh, that, that makes your other questions um, not answerable uh, by me, probably, like I say, I leave them to economists. Um, the other one that uh, Dr. Misigo asked and which I would like to um, answer is, how does the study speak about the Nyumbandogo? I want to believe that by the Nyumbandogo, you mean, um, you know, is it, do we call them uh, the other wife? Do we call them uh, the come we stay? Whatever it is. Uh, this is a difficult one because uh, it's not part of uh, my, my study to interrogate the situation of one. Some of them come to me um, in the course of the interview, you get to know this was a first wife, this was a second wife, uh, this was a concubine of sorts or something like that. But uh, where uh, somebody doesn't um, volunteer that information, uh, you, you, you kind of uh, let them not give it. But well, the Nyumba Ndogo women were there. I talked of the bachelors and uh, uh, may I say that uh, it is common knowledge that uh, men by themselves cannot stay for too long. So they got the, 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 the ndogondogos. Today we call them ndogondogos, not, not even the Nyumbandogo. And uh, those ndogondogos would stay. And in the sixties, they actually ended up marrying them. So they didn't stay in Dogo for, I mean, just in Dogo, they, they got married to these people. And polygamy was fashionable, so it was okay. Um, did they engage in trade? Some may have done. I have cases. I do not have time to elaborate, but some did. I have some evidence, we can talk later. Um, why don't we see a big hotels, a bank or something like that, that um, was started by women? Women's money from my studies does so much for the family. It is, They hardly save. A lot of that money goes into many, many other things. And uh, if we take the period I'm talking about, we are examining a period when women still believed that men were supposed to do the big things. Women started doing big things. And I think in 2023, I can give you evidence, but I'll not. But in the 1960s, women, our mothers believed that it was the man even to build that house. The woman's money was for food. The woman's money was for, it was supplementary. And I think I've talked about it at some point. It supplemented the man's earnings. So the man was the man, He's, he was the head. These days, things have changed we are doing things differently. So uh, when now I do my presentation for maybe 2000 and after, then we can talk more. Um, uh, Mwalimu, uh, Dr. Waka, your question is very hard and I want to be very honest with you. You have sent me back to the books. I have not, um, thoroughly examined the sessional paper. And uh, from your question, I honestly want to say that I will go and look at it and maybe know more. 
I think it's it's good to be honest. Um, then we have Angela asking about uh, intersectionality between ethnicity and the women's success. Um, in Nairobi, generally, the majority of traders uh, from what I have seen are Kikuyu. And this also has been established by many other works, um, uh, a key one being of um, Claire, Robins, uh, Claire Robertson. Um, we also have others and it's well established. And even the way the businesses are doing those businesses of the Kikuyus are doing very well. And Claire Robertson has come up with a very interesting idea uh, saying that uh, it was actually cultural among the Kikuyu to trade. And the, um, I, I don't know how to put it, but the, 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 the success of a woman was seen in how much money she brought in. And therefore, this has made uh, uh, Kikuyu women uh, very hardworking. And like, if you remember my case of Wamboi, that I said was a go-getter, she actually stands out, starting small and growing rapidly and even teaching herself how to count. And later in the 70s, she actually goes for adult education classes and gets herself to know how to record her earnings. So um, uh, Claire Rob uh, Robertson goes ahead to give some Kikuyu proverbs that actually encourage hard work, including trade. I could say they, they, they are probably in, uh, found in, uh, um, among other groups, uh, certain proverbs that encourage hard work, but the Kikuyu ones stand out in the sense of bringing home money. We have evidence in the archives uh, about Kikuyu and money making. And I don't need to push this point further home, I think. Uh, yeah. Um, whether they were able to mentor others, yes. Or we've mentored several women. I met them, I talked with them. Some of them are still selling fish like in um, Gikomba. Some of them are also in business elsewhere. In fact, Oweez was very unique as a Luo woman entering trade. At the beginning, she told me when she started by planting boga next to the house, um, planting vegetables next to the house and selling, other women, other Luo women laughed at her and said, you come to Nairobi to relax and you, you are busy planting vegetables. What do you mean? When your husband does not have money, but she continued working hard. Unfortunately, her husband dies around 1949. So she's left alone and she continues struggling. For her to get that CCN6, she had to use her son and um, Kenyatta. Jomo Kenyatta, who was then a nationalist. And I wouldn't go further into the story. Um, the, the role of the Luo Union. Um, uh, Dr. Biro, I didn't find that anywhere. Maybe now with your uh, from your question, I will try and find out 
but so far I have interviewed several Luo women uh, traders, but uh, none of them talks about the Luo Union. They knew it as an, um, as an organization that brought together the Luos, but in as far as uh, aid from it to traders, not yet. I didn't get anything. Um, interface uh, between gender dynamics and affirmative action, I didn't establish. So again, I have a lot of reading to do. Forgive me all for that. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Malimu. You know, I find it so hard to moderate with your teacher and it's such an interesting topic, which elicits a lot of debate, uh, particularly when you're dealing with women. And uh, before I invite the chair, maybe I'll, I'll maybe you'll want to look at, to also incorporate informal thread, a lot of informal thread, because you, you seem to have leaned on the side of legal thread and left out uh, uh, what Luis talks about, White talks about uh, the Waziwazi business around Pumwani and so many other things, including uh, the old story. I, I looked at the Boit papers at the National Archive, the Boit crime report, and you find that the major crime in 1970s all the way to uh, from 1960s to 1970s was wife stealing because of the money uh, around. So maybe you'll want to look at that. And also gene, the African gene business. And I think that is what Wilson wanted to hear also, the African gene uh, business in the informal settlement and were women trading in it? Were women also making busa and all that the European called it the African uh, gene? And maybe the employees, men have a tendency of going to take meals where women are cooking and many did always employ, who are the employees, the, the people that always employed, were they men or women? I would like to take this opportunity to invite our chair, Dr. please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David, for coordinating this. Uh, we, we have overshot our time. We normally stop at 4.30, uh, but the discussions were becoming a bit uh, uh, interesting. I know some people are going to class after this. Uh, I have a couple of meetings. Mine is just simple to thank you so much. Uh, our audience uh, online, we had quite a number of friends, uh, actually from different parts of the world. I saw uh, some friends from the United States. Uh, Professor Susan Mwala was here with us and uh, uh, a few people from Rajas University. I saw a friend from Rajas University in New York. Uh, thank you very much, our online audience. A number of our students, Angela, thank you. And uh, many of your colleagues, and uh, those of us who are here, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we had our uh, research associates. I saw Alina Oswald uh, here. Uh, maybe she has stepped out. We had our friend from Czech Republic, uh, Jan. He was here with us, and uh, uh, my very good friend Andrew from Berkeley University of California. Uh, he is still here with us. Thank you. Um, our next uh, seminar will be on the fourth of uh, May. We look forward to having you again. Thank you and God bless.